Well, good morning. Um, I suppose it's not going to be a surprise that we're um, celebrating harvest. Um, I'm getting rather hungry. I can smell. Shame you can't smell what I can smell. It smells amazing. Um, but we're here this morning just to, to spend this time, not just today, but obviously always, but just thanking and thinking about how wonderful our God is uh, in his provision. Things that we probably take for granted. Loaf of bread. We, we're not going through John today. But as we've gone through John, Jesus talks a lot about being the bread. The bread of life. And just to see that here and to understand what that means, it's amazing, isn't it? So we do welcome you to our, our Harvest Thanksgiving service. Thank you for the photos. Um, thank you for, for Ali to putting that together. And uh, as I say, this morning we're going to spend some time thinking about harvest and different types of harvest that we see in the Bible. Um, but let me start, shall we, by praying this morning. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we, um, we thank you for all your abundance, all the good gifts you give us. We thank you for the, uh, just a, a small selection of the much that you give us in front of us, the food that we eat and enjoy. We thank you, Lord, for, for blessing us Blessing us with harvest. Lord, we, we realise that it's such a, a gift, Lord, and we, we realise that we, we often take it for granted, especially in this day and age where we can go to a, a shop or a supermarket and, and seem to get whatever we want, though. Obviously, at the moment, Lord, we're aware of shortages because of various conditions. And Lord, almost that makes us even more thankful for what you've provided. So we come this morning with, with much gratitude to you, the God who provides, to you, the God who, who blesses. We thank you, Lord, for your grace this morning, your common grace that gives harvest and good to all. But Lord, we thank you too for the Lord Jesus, for your special grace that we find only in him. Lord, a, a crucified and a risen saviour. We thank you that uh, as much of these blessings are to us, we thank you for the blessing of a, of a saviour who loves us, who knows us and who saves us. So, Father, we do come and we do thank you. Lord, we're also aware that for some around this world, harvest is more difficult. That there is real shortages of food. That perhaps there is drought, perhaps through, uh, through weather or through, through war or through conflict. And there's famine, Lord, and we pray for those areas, for those people there. Lord, we pray that you'll help supply their needs. And Lord, that you'll make us uh, a grateful people, but also a people who give. And so, Lord, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We commit this service to you and pray, Lord, that you'll help us to, to focus, yes, on your good gifts, but to focus on you, our loving Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from um, Psalm and Psalm 104. Um, it's quite a... I was going to say a classic harvest. Um, I'm not going to be preaching from it, but I wanted to read it anyway. We're going to be, um, I'm going to use the term jumping around a bit in our sermon, but we'll, we'll have it on the screen hopefully before me. Not sure how well you'll be able to see it behind the squash and the bread, but we'll see. All right, but uh, let me read from Psalm 104, and it's going to be from verse 1 through to verse 23. So Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lay the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be moved. You covered it with a deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys, and they, they flow between the hills. 
They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirsts. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted, in them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness, and it is night, when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to work, and to his labour until evening. Amen. And even in that, that short passage, we, we see a little bit about the goodness of God, the greatness of God. We see what he provides. And uh, uh, we'll come to it in the sermon. But there's a, a glimpse back, if you like, if that's the right word, back to the flood. And we're going to spend a few minutes thinking about that this morning. Yes, to do with harvest. But uh, that's to come later. We're going to stand and we're going to sing, albeit behind our masks still, our first hymn this morning, and it's Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's stand and sing, shall we?
So th this morning, as I said earlier, I want to, I want to, that's terrible, I'd like to, I want to, um, consider um, some harvests, harvests that we see in the Bible. Now you might think, well, obviously there's the, the barley harvest, and there's going to be a wheat harvest, and a, a grape harvest, you know, no, not those sort of harvests, but other harvests, um, well, maybe some of those, but harvests are, uh, are mentioned particularly in the Bible. And the first one, I suppose, is the one that we would think about today more than anything else. We, we have God's provision for us. And I want to take that back, if you like, right to the very beginning of the Bible, back to the book of Genesis and Genesis chapter 8 in particular. Let me read a couple of verses, well, actually, from Genesis chapter 6. And verses 5 and 7, and they say this. It might be a bit awkward for you to read, but uh, I'll read it out loud for you. So um, listen to, to what's written in, in Genesis 6, verses 5 and 7. It says this. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only, was only evil continually. And then verse 7. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. Do you not find those just absolutely, I was going to say depressing, distressing words that God wrote about, about you and me, about us, about mankind in general? And I suppose... If you were to read those verses today, and perhaps if you were, you were new to the Bible, and perhaps you'd not read the Bible, the, the big question might be, well, well, okay, so, so what happened? You know, after all, we're, we're here today, we're, we're celebrating yet another harvest, you know, as part of a, a worldwide population of, and I looked it up this morning, 7.8 billion people as of January 2021, so maybe a couple more by now, I'm not sure. <laughs> So what happened? Because obviously, and looking out, it's obvious, mankind wasn't wiped out. We're still here. Oh, there you go. See, it's just a fairy tale, they'll say. That's all it is. Well, that's not the case. Actually, the, the writer of Genesis tells us what happened in, in ten short words. In uh, chapter 6, verse 8, he says this. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I think that's ten words. Ten. Yes, I'll repeat it because I'm now sure it's ten words. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Here we have a man, I suppose you could say in, in other words, a man who caused God to change his mind. Was he, a, was he a special man? Well, well, yes, certainly I believe he was a special man. Otherwise, God wouldn't have saved him. Was he a, a perfect man, fully deserving all the, the blessings that he received? Oh, well, well, we'll see about that. And so if you're, if you're familiar with, with Genesis and with the, the story of the flood and then you'll, you'll know that, that God sent rains and the earth flooded and everyone perished. Apart from Noah and his family and on all the animals that they took with them into the ark. And then after the entire earth was covered, the rain stopped and the waters began to recede, we read. What a judgment. What a judgment, what a terrible judgment on humanity. Just Noah and his family and the animals in the ark that survived. And yet the Bible tells us it was a judgment that was deserved. It was the, the result of, of mankind's complete rejection of their creator God. And, and he's the one who, who actually gives them what they've been asking for. The removal of his, his protecting presence from them, they got what they wanted. And it ended up in their destruction. And but, but here, 
we have Noah and his family and his animals. The, the waters have subsided. The ark's now grounded back on the dry land, so to speak. And they're ready to step out onto a, onto a cleansed earth, I suppose you could say that. You know, a, a fresh start, a new start. The whole of the world before them. Oh, oh surely, now, surely now God and, and humanity were going to, to exist together in harmony, just like they did you know, with Adam and Eve before they fell. Surely mankind will, will recognize not only God's sovereignty over them, but, but also their, our true position before him as his servants. But not just as servants, as receivers of grace. You'd think so, wouldn't you, especially after that awful, fully deserved destruction. However, what do we find? Well, at the end of Genesis 8, we see how Noah goes out of the ark. And the first thing he does, you think this is really great, this is great. The first thing he does when he comes out of the ark is to give glory to God. Oh, perhaps Noah's got it right. He gives glory to God and he builds an altar and he carries out, I think it's termed as pleasing sacrifices to God. And we read that, that God smells, receives the sacrifices. And he promises from now on the harvest, the mark, if you like, of, of God's constant blessings on, on living creatures will never cease. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? And yet, even, even then, notice, notice actually what God does say in Genesis 8, verses 21 and 22. God says this. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, remember, of, of Noah's um, sacrifice, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Listen for the next bit. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. In other words, God is saying that, that despite the flood, despite the, the death and destruction which resulted from it, and despite Noah having been spared, God says, actually, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed with mankind. Because God knows only too well, God recognises, God sees, that the very heart of you and me, of human beings, is corrupt. And it's as, as rebellious as it ever was. Actually, Noah and his family weren't perfect, as we'd hoped. So the fact is that after that mankind, after the flood, still doesn't deserve God's blessing. It's true, today we don't deserve God's blessing. And we still don't deserve his protection. In fact, they deserved, and we deserve, the, the opposite. We deserve, just as those people during the flood, we deserve complete and utter destruction, annihilation. And yet, and yet in spite of, of that condition before God, God promises that the harvest will continue. Oh, isn't he full of grace? Isn't that wonderful? What a, what a gracious gift from God the harvest is for us today. I'm looking here and I see apples and all sorts. There's lots down the front I can't even see. And it's just, isn't God good? Isn't God good to us? And isn't he faithful in keeping his promise? Not just the promise of harvest, but all his promises. But there's another harvest I want to consider, if you like. See, God continues to bless his undeserving creation by, by giving us good things, by providing us with his good harvest. And yet actually there's another harvest 
which is being produced at the same time, which is equally as real, but not this time a, a harvest which is good. No, this other harvest is the harvest which, which sin produces. The harvest that results from the, the rejection of all that is good, the rejection of God. Paul says in, in his letter to the Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 7, he says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And we have that saying, don't we? A, a man reaps what he sows. We, we say that today. It's familiar. And actually, isn't that really the, the very definition of a harvest? Because after all, a harvest time is, is when you reap what you sow. The time when all that was planted at the beginning of the season has borne fruit, which is now lifted and, and put on display or put into, into storage. But the fact is that the harvest that God provides isn't deserved. So although we, we benefit from it, we're not actually reaping what we sow. Oh, perhaps we put the seed in, but it's God who gives the growth, isn't it? God who brings the, the rain and the sunshine and the weather. and It's God who causes to grow. We receive it, but only because God is merciful. Because God doesn't treat us as we deserve. No, the, the true fruit of, of our sowing it's seen all around us. It's seen in the, the wars that takes its toll all over the world. It's seen in, in diseases and, and pandemics. It's seen in the collapse of, of good governments and in the failure of care and the corruption of our institutions. It's seen in the, the breakup of marriages and homes. It's seen in the, the confusion surrounding God's ordained roles and designations. That's, that's the harvest that we reap because of sin. And we see it everywhere, don't we? Not only do we see it out there in the world, but when we look inside, we see it too. And we know it's true of us in our own hearts. And it won't go away. And it's piling up higher and higher as the means of, of self-destruction both for ourselves and for our world. So how do we deal with this great harvest that sin produces? How, how do we remove it? Do you know what? I was, I was thinking about what the world says and there's been so many lectures given, so many books written, so many papers written, so many documentaries about it, about how we can put the world right really is what we're saying. And there's been lots of answers put forward for, for example, you know, if we teach people to be nicer, then, then everything will be fine. And actually, that's often what the church teaches. Or, or if we can increase the number of, of professionals in the, in the caring sector, if we have more nurses, we love, we love a good nurse, don't we? We love a good nurse. Then, then everything will be fine. Or if we, if we educate people to, to higher levels of, of education so that they'll, they'll understand the, the foolishness of displaying these negative characteristics. Oh, that, that's the answer. Or perhaps we'll change the thinking of society so that everything is acceptable. Does that sound familiar today? And, and not to criticise. And as long as it doesn't involve anyone getting hurt, we'll be fine. All these things are put forward, don't you? And I'm sure you recognize a few of them. Some of them seem quite modern, don't they? Or perhaps some people will simply ignore the harvest of sin and blame what they see on a God who doesn't care. And there's some people who aren't buying into any of these worldviews. They're trying to find their own answers only to discover that actually they're not a victim of this harvest of sin at all, but they're part of the problem. And so despair sets in and they give up and they let go. 
and they start sliding down into excess and beyond. Harvest of sin is not good. It's not pleasant. And yet the harvest provided by God still continues despite all the sin around us and within us. And that gives us reason to hope. Because that's a, that's a signpost. Yeah, a signpost to something better. We've looked at it already in our series on John. But, but listen to, to what John the Gospel writer writes in, in John chapter 4, verses 34 to 36. Jesus speaking. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then the harvest comes? Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. The, the harvest time then the, is when you reap what you sow. And so bearing in mind what we've already said about the, the two previous harvests that we've just thought about, one totally undeserved and one fully deserved. How do we get to a, a position where we who, who live, who inhabit this earth, how do we get to a point where we recognize and acknowledge God's wonderful gifts and love for us? While at the same time we cease harvesting the destructive, destructive fruits of sin. Well, the truth of the matter is that we're never going to get to that place. Not by our own efforts. Not on our own. It's impossible. And yet, and yet the, 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 wonderful, the wonderful, we call it good news, the wonderful news for all of us is that there is someone who can. And it's someone who no other man who found favor with God in, in the midst of a world that rebelled against God. It's someone that, that Noah points us to, actually. To the, to the one who reaps God's harvest, not because of God's mercy, but because he sowed it. John, again in, in chapter 1 and verse 3, he tells us this. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The one who doesn't reap the fruits of sin because he is the, the ultimate righteous one. He is the, the sinless one. Who is it? Of course, it's the Lord Jesus. You knew that was coming. It's always about him, isn't it? And rightly so. The only one who's qualified to, to help humanity. We've become so, so cut off from God, our creator by sin and its fruits. There's nothing that we can do. Who, despite God's mercy, that who enables us to, to continue to enjoy the, the fruits of his harvest blessing. We're simply powerless to do anything about to improve our situation in any worthwhile way, any meaningful way, any eternal way. Oh, that's not going to stop us, is it, from trying to improve things by our own efforts. But at the end of the day, the fact is that all that effort will be in vain without Jesus. Because the truth is actually... Well, it's the truth of our very existence. The truth is that concerning life as it should be lived on earth, concerning life that, that satisfies and fully fulfills us, such existence can, can never be achieved by our own efforts. No, it's, it can only be received as a gift from our Creator. Can't be earned. Can't be won. There's no lottery. And that's why Paul 
writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians uh, 1 verses 23 and 24. He says this, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But, but to those whom God has called both Jew and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's the hope that we have. That's the good news that we have. We preach Christ crucified. We don't tell you to go out and make yourselves better. We don't get, tell you to, to stop doing this and stop doing that. No, we just say, look to Christ. Consider him. Consider what he's done for you. Consider his, his sacrificial death on the cross. Why? To save you. To ransom you. To bring you back to God. To put you in that relationship that, yes, that Adam and Eve lost. And in fact, that the relationship that Noah and his family should have had, but failed because of their sin. Friends, God is in the giving business. And we human beings are made to be in the business of receiving and of praising and of worshipping him because of the gifts that he does give us. And then giving him back our all. Our hearts. Yes, our bodies. Yes, our minds. Yes, our obedient service. And when we realise that that is the case, and when we gratefully submit to his perfect will for us, then we receive his salvation. Then, then we reap the harvest of the gospel. And that's the challenge for us, isn't it? Those are the harvests that are there before us. There are other ones, absolutely. But these are the ones I wanted to think of this morning. God's harvest of undeserved plenty. The harvest that comes from sin. But the harvest of the gospel. We're going to finish by singing our last hymn this morning. And it's blessed be your name. Let's uh, stand, shall we, and sing together.
Heavenly Father, we, we come before you this morning and we want to bless your name. Lord, we, we bless you for your good gifts. We bless you for your bountiful provision, for your harvest. But thank you for the, the promise that you've given us. Thank you for your faithfulness in it. And Lord, we want to thank you for the Lord Jesus, the greatest gift of all. We thank you for him. We thank you for his love for us. Lord, we pray that we will be men and women and boys and girls who, who live every day to, to worship him, to please him. Lord, to glorify you, Heavenly Father. So we do pray and we, we thank you for your provision and for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.